I had requested that uh, once in a month I share in your meetings and uh, as the Lord prospers us that's what I want to do today I have a short message for you you can call it in search of the man in search of the man the message I have for you so in search of a man and I'm drawing the message from Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 9 Genesis 3, 9, the Bible says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? Knowing the attributes of God, knowing the character, the nature of God, this question is a very strange question. Because one thing that we know about God, he is all-knowing. All-knowing. It's omniscient. So, does it mean that God at this one particular time he suffered amnesia? He could not understand where Adam was. Does it mean that God lost his omniscience until he wanted Adam to tell him where he was? Does it mean that God is not all present that even where Adam was God was there? Will it mean so? Does it mean that God was actually searching for Adam and he could not find him. One thing we note is that God is everywhere at the same time in the same capacity. As David says it in uh, Psalm 139. In Psalm 139 if you pick it from verse number 1, the Bible says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hands upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Now look at verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light and about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Now look at the God we are talking about, and then he is the one asking, Adam, where are you? So we need to think about it and ask ourselves, what was God actually doing at that time? For us to understand this, we need to go back a little bit in the Bible and look at uh, uh, Genesis chapter 2, maybe chapter 1 verse 26, the creation of Adam, just um, uh, for a brief moment. Chapter 1 verse 26, the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the uh, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So this is a man that God has created, and God has given dominion. So this is a man that God has created Himself, and look at the three things that God has said there. Number one, let us create man in our image. In our image. Number two, after our own likeness. According to our likeness. Number three, let them have dominion. Look at those three things. Number one, in our image. The thing is this, what is the image of God? Then you discover according to John chapter 4 verse 24, God is spirit. 
God is not flesh and blood. God is spirit. So when the Bible says in our image, then God is talking about the spiritual being of a man. The spiritual being of a man. When he says in our likeness, God is talking about his attributes that are communicable, that he can share with a man. For example, when we say God is love, we know that God has shared it to a little extent, man can also love. Man may not love to the same extent as God, but man has the ability to love. When we say God is all-powerful, we know that man has this area of mighty also. We have powerful men. When we say God is sovereign, all of us have our areas of sovereignty. So each and every attribute of God, whether it's mercy, whether it's grace, whether it's kindness, they are those that are communicable to us and we share them in a limited manner. So God says, he, let us create man in our own image according to our likeness. If you see that word according, it means that God had a mold. Like if you want to make bricks, you make the mold of a brick first before you put in mortar to make a brick. And therefore God had a mold when he was creating us and that mold is God himself. So he created us after his own likeness. Uh, we are like God. We resemble God. But he says, let us give him dominion. Dominion over everything under the sun. Dominion. That's what I want you to watch for today. Dominion. So now, God has given man dominion. Now, where does man exercise his dominion? Then God comes in chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, and verse number 15, the Bible says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So now, God is placing man in the place where he will exercise his dominion. And that place now is the Garden of Eden. And it says, God, God himself is the one who took the man and placed him there. Let's reflect on that. Have you ever imagined that where you are, even right now for you being here, is God who has guided you to this place today? Have you ever thought that it is God who has ordered your steps because the Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. So it's just not something that you thought like, ah, I should be going for this meeting. That desire is God who puts in you. Then he gives you the time. Then he gives you the ability, the strength, the eagerness. He gives you the people that you can fellowship with. So God makes everything beautiful so that you can fit in. That's the plan of God. Before he put man in the garden of Eden, he made it a pleasurable place. There were all kinds of manner of plants there for food and just for pleasure of man. God is not, did not bring man to a bad place. Everywhere God leads you, you may think that this place maybe is bad, but it's God who is putting you in that place. And I want to be so sure that all of us who are seated here right now is, is by divine counsel, is by divine guidance, is by divine power that we all find ourselves here at a time like this. God did it. But now, when God puts him there, in verse 15, it doesn't just end up there. Verse 16 it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Verse 17. But of the tree of the, the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now look at what God does. He is the one who takes man and puts him in the garden of Eden. He is the one who puts the tree of the knowledge of good and evil there. He is the one who puts the tree of life there. He is the one who puts the numerous trees for food. And he tells man, go in the garden. Stay in this garden. And while you are in this garden, there is one tree that is prohibited, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is one tree that if you eat of it, you will flourish the tree of life. And there are several trees here you can enjoy food for free. So man has been given 
a place to stay. He has been given uh, prohibitions and he has been given provision. Think about it. God provides, but within the plenteous provision, he tells you, don't touch this. Don't, 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 don't. Here, don't go. He draws a red line. Why does God do that? Because in every place of freedom, there must be a test of loyalty. There must be a test of loyalty. It is never, you can never say uh, you love somebody until that person messes up your life and you still love him. If you have never tested, you can never say that I love this person. You can never say I can never steal until you are following someone behind and a bunch of 10,000 falls down and you say, brother, you are about to lose your money. Kabira, Kabira mezema da hiyo. Unajua mekumbuka shida zote ziko kwa nyumba yake. Mezema 10,000. But you, you can never say that you are not a thief until such things happen in your life. So until you have been tested and you have been proven, you can never brag of who you are. And how does God test if man can love him freely? He puts there a tree. And not without prohibition. He tells him, man, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. In other words, by eating on this tree, you have actually disobeyed me. You have rebelled against me. You have become hostile to my word. You are contrary to my word. And who is God to Adam? God is the creator of Adam. God is the provider of Adam. God is the one who sustains Adam. In other words, God is everything to Adam. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. You know, Adam did not sin against God because he, was a, he had a sin nature. No. Adam was morally pure. Innocent of any sin but powerless in the face of temptation. The fact that you have not done a sin, don't brag before people. It's because you have never been tempted. The opportunity has not come. Most of us will like to laugh at others. A whole believer, you have never been tested, my brother. When that comes your way, you will find that even the other guy was a little bit better. And one person who can never condemn you or laugh at you or despise you because I found you fallen. What you cannot do is continue in it. Live continually in sin. That one is not allowed. But the fact that you have fallen one day, you have noticed you have woken up and you are ready to move on is our day-to-day -day life. It's our day-to-day -day life. And here we have Adam who has everything he needs. He has never been tempted and he is given freedom to, to choose whether to honor God or dishonor God. Now, after that, you remember Adam was given dominion. Now he has been given prohibition. He has been given provision. And now he has a prohibition. He, is, he has dominion, rule. Rule, tawala. Then he has provision, eat from every tree. Every tree, including the tree of life. He was told, eat from every tree. But now we have a prohibition, only one tree. Don't eat from this one tree. And God says now, ready, go. But before God goes, he gives him a responsibility. So look at it. I want you to understand. On creation, Adam has dominion. Please mark that. He is the ruler of the earth on behalf of God. He is called a vassal king. A king who rules on behalf of the other king. So he has dominion. Number two, he has provision. Everything you need, eat Adam. Eat everything you need. And is in a pleasurable place. Number three, he has one prohibition. Adam, in as much as you are eating everything, this one don't eat from it. Because that was the test. Do will you honor me or not honor me? 
then now Adam has a responsibility. Adam, it's not, it's not just a matter of eating and drinking. You have work to do. Work in the garden. I wanted to think, like you have employed someone, you have a, uh, a brother Mondo was just talking to me about, now it's, it's planting time. So Mondo, imagine you have employed someone in, the, in your chamber at home. He's supposed to be taking care of that land. You send money, tell him now, please, it's time to plow. He says, yes, sir. Tell him now it's time to plant. He says, yes, sir. Tell him now it's time to weed. He says, yes, sir. Then you go one day and find the land is just fallow lying there. What do you think about this man? <laughs> He's a con man. <laughs> An idiot. <laughs> That's what is happening with God. He has, he, has, he has told Adam, this is now your world. I rule heaven, you rule earth. You are the man with the dominion. Number two, you have every provision you will not lack as long as you are here. Number three, you have, you have one prohibition. Number four, you have a responsibility. Take care of the land. Take care of the land. Then, the best thing that ever happened to Adam is now he's given a wife. You know, you know a, 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 a woman is the first gift that God ever gave man. So Adam is given a gift. He, he went to sleep. God uh, did the first surgery. You hear these things called anesthesia, all these kind of things. It's, God was the first one to do a surgery. Eh? Surgery from a man and removed a part of the man and created a man. And when the man wakes up, he is presented with something that he has never seen before. The man looks at it. He has seen elephants. He has seen squirrels. He has seen lions. He has seen a giraffe. He has seen all this. He has seen the tortoise. <laughs> Some man has seen all this. But he has never seen as something as good as what is presented before him. And immediately, Adam has a poem. This is bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. It was poetic. And it's believed that he said it with a dance at least. He must have danced. Adam must have enjoyed it in a way. He expressed the highest joy when he saw Eve. Until he named her. He said, God, I'm not going to wait. Let me give her a name. Do you know by giving a name to Eve, he was claiming authority over Eve. So now, he even has dominion over Eve. Then, the blessings of God maketh rich but adds no sorrow. They say so. So, Adam is supposed to be leading Eve, but now, Adam is in the Garden of Eden and the the devil comes to visit in the embodiment of a, a serpent and Adam with all his dominion never said one thing. Adam with all his divine God-given power and authority he never said one thing to, this, to Satan. He allowed Satan fellowship with his wife. They had fellowship. The woman tried to defend herself. If you, if you read the whole narrative, you will discover that Eve tried her best. She put forward a spirited defense because she said, God told us that we should not eat from this tree. We should not touch it because if we eat, do so, we will die. Eve had some doctrine in herself. But the problem with the doctrine that Eve had was had been uh, was diluted had been corrupted, had been defiled. She didn't have the right doctrine. Because God, number one, God didn't tell her not to touch that tree. But again, as men, you know we don't trust our wives. So you are passing the word of God to your wife, you tell her, uh, sweetheart, God said we should not eat from this tree. But something tells you, this woman, she will eat. Something tells you, you know, that, that thing that talks to you. So you tell her, darling, are you hearing what I'm saying? What God indeed said that you should never even move close to that tree and touch it. Something that God never said. So the moment you start mixing the word of God with your own human uh, uh, philosophies, then it is no longer the word of God. 
So Eve is presenting what Pastor Adam taught her. Now as a man here, I don't know if you realize that you have a responsibility in your house to lead your house in the things of God. You have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to teach your wife the word of God. You have a responsibility to lead your wife into worship. If the responsibility is turned upside down, then God is not in charge of that house. If it's the woman who is leading you and telling you what to do, God is not in charge of that house because God has never given a woman the responsibility to lead a man. When Adam was given responsibility, Eve was still within the man. Eve was still within the man. Eve was removed from the man for the man. You know, God is, God is humorous. He comes and takes a portion of you, then he tells you, I've created for you this. You know, what was just yours from the beginning? But something I want, I want us to agree as men, as a believer in Christ Jesus, you have a God-given authority to lead your home. Leading your home is so different from dictating your home. The truth is this. Every woman is looking for a man who can lead her. Women don't like leading. And when women lead, they lead us astray. So every time you abdicate your authority to lead, then you need to understand you are agreeing to be misled. Let me repeat this. Let me repeat this. In the entire Bible, you know people say that I'm a, a male chauvinist, but I'm a Bible believer. And I'll show you. I'm a Bible believer. In the entire Bible, God has never allowed a woman to lead a man, whether at home or in the church. No such is allowed. They are, they are nurses. They are life givers. But at home and in the church, never. So, so let me take you through. Why did God create Adam first and not Eve first? Was it a mistake? Was it an accident? we have what we call position of priority. So God created man first as a position of priority. And that position of priority is leadership. It's a privilege. Men, it's a privilege to lead your family. The, the, the cheapest way, if you, you are not acquainted with scriptures, acquainted with scriptures, is to hide yourself, listen to a sermon, and then tell her, let's discuss this sermon. You see, you don't need to be the one who knows scriptures. In a place like this where we are meeting as men, let's sharpen each other. As we talk about businesses, as we talk about investments, as we talk about morality, as we talk about uh, life skills, let us also talk about scriptures. So that the scripture you have learned here on Wednesday, you can go home and say, sweetheart, sit down, it's time for prayer. We cannot wait for our wives to be the ones telling us we have not prayed. Our wives to be the ones telling us we have not read the scripture. Are we going to church? No. We are the ones who wake up early in the morning at, at, at 6. I wonder if you can wake up at 6 going to work from Monday to Saturday. You can wake up at 5 now going to worship the one who has given you that job. To worship the one who supplies every of your need. To worship the one who has healed you. To worship the one who has protected you. You can wake up even the earliest by the time your family is waking up, you are ready. You are telling them, Minda wache. You know, two Sundays ago, uh, I, I woke up lazy on a Sunday. And I'm the preacher. I was lazy. And uh, mama was prepared. All my other people in the house were ready. But I was not ready. I told them, why don't you go? I'll follow you. They said, no. No, no. Then mama told me, do you think it's romantic for us to be going to church late? Have you ever heard about that, such a question like that? Because <laughs> do you think it's romantic for us to be going to church late? We should be walking in like now we are so romantic. You know why? They are our helpers. So they can joke you when you are about to mess up. They are our helpers. Let me show you. So Adam was created first position of priority and privilege first. After Adam, people got started getting born in the world. 
but God comes and picks Nu or Noah to be the one to build the ark. Is it an accident? After Noah, God comes and picks Abraham. Is it an accident? After Abraham, God says that now we are going to the nation of Israel, so God picks Moses. Is it an accident? After the children of Israel are out of Egypt and God institutes a few offices. Number one, the office of a judge. Okay. There was no single woman who was allowed to be a judge. One woman called Deborah slipped in because a man called Barak refused to go to war. So Deborah said, if you can't go, I will go. So when you see women stepping up, even in the church, know that men are sleeping in that church. When you see women stepping there, the one emotional, doing this and doing that and making things happen, know that men have gone to sleep. Because when Barak said, I'm not going, Deborah said, I'll do it. I'll do it. That's the only judge who was a woman. So that's good. So God says, the first office was a judge, and even God removes that office. Then he brought other three offices. The office of a king, the office of a priest, and the office of a prophet. Have you ever heard any woman that God chose as a king, a priest, and a prophet? Yes, no. We have a place of privilege. We have a place of priority. So, God of the Old Testament was legalistic. He didn't like women. He was a legalistic God. So now the God who is full of grace and truth, Jesus Christ comes on earth. And you know what? He chooses 12 disciples, all men. That's another accident, isn't it? All men. And they were wonderful women ministering to him daily by their own resources. They do business and come and serve Jesus Christ. He never appointed any one of them. And now, brethren, that's the man full of grace and truth. And now he hands over the office to people called apostles. You know, we have tried to look in the Bible to say, oh, even so and so, Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla was an apostle. We'll try and defend it until when? God never chose even one apostle who was a woman. Paul says, I am the least of all apostles. Think about it. When Paul is giving instructions about a bishop, a pastor, a deacon, an elder, he says, must be a man of how many wives? One wife. All these are mistakes, eh? Oh, women are supposed to be leading men. Never, never, never. Never. Women have a supporting place in ministry. Their ministry is to support what we do. To ensure that we achieve our purpose. But when it comes to positions that involve instruction, Positions that involve authority. God never gave a single woman any leadership. But men have let God down. Just like in the Garden of Eden. There's this man who has been given the dominion. Now, the serpent is tempting his wife and is whistling around. <laughs> we cannot say that time he had gone to uh, the market because the fruits were just there. We can't say he had gone to take some changa. There was no changa at that time. He was just there. Looking at his wife being tormented by Satan and he's just there doing nothing. And that's what is making the world go the way it's going. Because we have men that God has intended to lead, to rule right from their family to the church, to the governments. But men have abdicated the areas of rule. So God comes in the Garden of Eden and finds such a man called Adam. And he had one question. Adam, where are you? Where are you? So, when the children are suffering, until right now we have come up with stupid things that were never there in the, even in the dictionary. At baby mama, daddy, ma, daddy, baby, baby daddy, a lot of nonsense. Co-parenting. 
when children now are being exposed to single parenting, where is the father? Where is the man who lied to this girl beautiful and impregnating at her? When wives are being left crying alone in their house, where is the husband? When churches are being left to women now to run, women are making decisions, women are the one now in the front line, where is the man? Where is the man that God created and gave authority and gave dominion? God is in search of his men. God is in search of that man that he created. But that man is lost in some other things. We have been so intimidated by the power of women. Women are coming up, they are eloquent. These days if you take a small boy and put him here and a small girl and tell them to express themselves, the boy does not know how to talk. Because women are becoming more eloquent, women are becoming more bold, and men are going down and down and down. Because even the fathers who are supposed to bring them to a level of leadership are absent. They are not in the house. They are not there. And even if they are in the house, they are not taking their place of responsibility. The father knows how to read a, a, a newspaper, to watch television, and to sleep. Because he's a tired man. You know, he has been busy working. And your family is going down the trench. God is looking for that man that he created. And he's asking, where are you? Where are you? Now, women have downgraded us. We look like we are second class citizens. We are so downgraded. If you go on social media, women are saying how they can do without us. They can live without us. Because they are not seeing us take our place of responsibility. And we have become useless things in the eyes of women. Most of us, if we go to our houses, the things that we are being told by our wives, we are because there is no clear leadership. Look at our young men. They have resorted to violence. Because they cannot lead, so now they kill. Where is the man? Because even in a church like this one, we need the men to be mentoring the young people, showing them the ways of God, giving them skills to live in life, giving them skills to lead. But where is the man? Where is the man? God is still calling in the bushes of the Garden of Eden. He's saying, Adam, where are you? Where are you? Twelve men, brethren, twelve men, they turned the world upside down with the gospel. Twelve men. We are more than, are you twelve here? Or more than twelve? We are more than twelve. Twelve men who heard from God and they broke camp and advanced they turned the world upside down in the gospel. That's why we are reading the Bible today. Because of 12 obedient men. The same power that Peter had, we have it. The same power that Paul had, we have it. We can still arise and turn this country upside down. We can still do that. Adam, where are you? <laughs> where are you? Adam allowed his wife to listen to Satan through the serpent and now take the position of leadership and Adam was there. Look at Genesis 3.17. Are we there? 3.17. I just want to read part A. The Bible says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. So if God was prosecuting Adam, what is the problem of Adam? He has heeded the voice of Eve. What's wrong with that? I never gave Eve the position to rule over you, to direct you, to counsel you. I told Eve to help you. But now, you are the one now helping your wife. I am a man who believes that this country can change immediately when men take their position of leadership right from the house. Because our children will see that strong leadership. They will admire it. They will grow up as leaders also. You see, our churches will be vibrant because men are busy leading 
and showing direction and the results are being seen. If that does not happen, if that does not happen, we'll continue calling Benin here to come and fall bishops down in the stadium. We will do that and again and again and again until a man arises. We need to meet here always and talk about our finances. Talk about our investments. Talk about our life skills, how to face different stages of lives. You know, you know life has graduation from one stage to another stage. Uh, my son went to the Baba when he was here during uh, the midterm and they charged him a lot of money. So I asked him, you always pay 200. How comes we are paying 400 today? I didn't know Prince Agonandevu. At a major lemba, to be to get to really have to run a chat that charge you a 200 shillings extra. It's a stage in life, you see. And men go through different stages. Some of us don't know how to behave when we are 40 because there are things happening in our bodies that are at 40. We don't know how to behave when we get to 50 because there are changes in our body, in our family, everything. We don't know how to behave, you see. And the time is coming. For me, it's just near. When all the children leave you alone there with your wife alone. You can watch TV, you can watch magazine. You can watch TV, you can watch TV. 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 There's nobody to give orders around. We need to prepare ourselves how to transition from one level to another level. We need to prepare ourselves how to invest. We need to prepare ourselves. But again, the most important thing, we need to prepare ourselves to serve God. So God sent me to ask you, where are you? At home, in the church, in the community, where are you? So what was God asking Adam? Is where, I, can't, I can't see you. I can't find you. No. Is I'm looking at your seats. You're supposed to be chairing this meeting and you're not there. You're not in your place of leadership. You're not in your position. You're not in your place of privilege. You're not in your place of priority. So where are you? He was calling Adam to a place he can realize that actually I've messed up. Actually I've messed up. But the problem with a man is pride. He never says, maybe I need to make adjustments. Man will always defend his position. That's why when uh, God asked him in verse 11 and he said, Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? So God is bringing Adam to a level of understanding that there are things you have believed that I never told you. Are you seeing that in verse 11? There are things that now you believe and you are responding to them, you are applying them in your life and I'm not the one who taught you. Who told you? Now, as a man, the way you behave in your house, the way you behave in the community, the way you behave in the church, if God asked you, who told you? What will be your answer? There are only two sources of instruction, God or Satan. So if your answer is not God you'd send me, then you are answering, Satan has told me. I'm challenging us. I'm telling you, families are bleeding. Churches are bleeding. Our society is bleeding because the man has gone into hiding. Covering himself with leaf fig tree leaves thinking that God will not find him. We are covering ourselves with fig tree leaves. God is saying, okay, so where are you? Where are you in regards to our relationship? I've always been coming here asking you to name animals and you have named animals. I came here, I wanted to create for you a wife, you are just available, I created for you a wife. I've come in the cool of the day just to fellowship with you, we have always done that. Now, who told you the things that you are applying in your life until you've started running away from me, you are ashamed of me, you are hiding away from me, who told you all these things? And Adam never realized what God wants him to know is that he has sinned against God, he has disobeyed God, he has been hostile to the word of God. He never 
realize that I'm being told I need to understand that I'm rebellious. He answered and said like this. In verse 12. Then the man said, the woman whom you gave me, you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Aha. And I stuck him here. In other words, I didn't take the position of leadership. I allowed my wife to lead me. <laughs> I allowed my wife to lead me. If you have a daughter, if you have a daughter, do you have daughters? We have daughters. So if you have a daughter, I want to ask you a question. Are you ready? Are you ready for my question? If you found out that your daughter is getting married to a man who has your exact character, will you be happy? No. A man who behaves exactly the way you behave. No, think about it. <laughs> so where will you get the moral authority to tell your daughter you cannot get married to a man like this? And that man is a replica of who you are. Your character, your way of life must be that man that you want your daughter to get married to. If you are not that man, then God is asking you, where is the question? Where are you? Let me ask you another question. If you are a woman, if you are a woman and you want to get married, will you marry a man who behaves like you? You are a girl, you want to get married and you, you, you know the characters of all this man. That, that's what you have, those characters. And you know him like that and you are a girl. Just put yourself the feet of that woman who wants to get married to you. If you are a girl, if you are the woman, will you get married to a, woman, a man like you? A man like yourself? Most of us will not want. This is a challenge, brothers. This is a challenge. <laughs> this is a challenge. So let's go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Now the big question is here. I thought sin entered the world through Eve. She's the one who had fellowship with Satan. She's the one who ate of the forbidden tree. How comes God is charging Adam with the entry of sin, the admission of sin in the world? How comes? God is saying, sin was admitted in the world through one man. What is that? Because he is charging the one to whom he gave responsibility. Responsibility. So, it is not Eve was given the responsibility, it is Adam who was given the responsibility and therefore Adam is charged as the progenitor of sin. But look at it again. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, so what does that mean? The sin, the rebellion of one man, the hostility of one man, the disobedience of one man spread upon all people. So, what one man does can affect many people. What you do can affect generations and generations to come. You know, con men outside here are reaping so much from our families, telling them that they're delivering them from generational curses. And there's nothing called generational curses. It is the habits, it is the characters that we hand over to our family. Because when we are doing what we are doing, our children are watching. And therefore, you are the only model man that they know. They have no other model man. They are the only model man. I don't know if you know that children think that their fathers are awesome. Even if Tyson, who is the, the boxing in Universe I? From Tyson, I've never known any other person who has been a champion of boxing. Even if Tyson came here and threatened your child, five-year-old child, tell me what you need to do town. Because your child thinks that you are the most powerful person on earth. 
You are awesome. You you are, you are the brightest person. You you are you are you have wisdom. You are unique. Your child never thinks otherwise about you. So a child grows up admiring you, and whatever you portray to him, that's what he admires. And when he reaches of his age, that's exactly what he'll do. Then we start going to look for people to deliver us. There is someone right now who can say, this is the end of this habit. This is the end of this character in my family. I am breaking it here. I want to serve God righteously. I want to walk in front of my children. They see that this is the way their father is walking, is behaving because you want to break that. You can choose that from your family the things that happen to your grandfather and they happen to your father and they are happening to you, they will never happen again. You can make that choice. I said they will never happen again. It's just by choice. But you don't make choice by fleshly desires. You go to God in prayer. You go to God in faith. You serve him diligently. You give yourself sacrificially to him. You learn his word. You lead your family. Let your, your children see you telling them, come and sit around the table. We have YouTube. We have YouTube. Let's pray. Because close your eyes. You open. Father, in the name of Jesus. You know? Let them see you doing that, leading them praying over them, laying your hand over them and telling them you are blessed. That's the work of a father. A father is not to donate sperm. You know, after we have given out a sperm, we think now that means you have a father. No! A father in how you bring up those children now. And the only way you can bring up those children is in the fear of the Lord. You will be so sure that even when you are not there, they are safe and secure. Amen? What Adam did, one man spread upon all men. The things we are doing, whether good or bad, they are spread in our, our family. The consequence of sin of Adam, death has spread upon all people. So, if it is a good thing you are doing, the benefit will spread upon all people. If it is a bad thing, the effects will spread upon all people. We need to stop our families from being victims of our bad behaviors. Man, where are you? Where are you? In First Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. It says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Are you there? So you have the head. The head means the source of power and authority. Head means the chief, the leader. The kefale of every man is Christ. The head of every man is Christ. Paul is addressing the church here, not non-believers. So he's talking to believers. So he wants us to know that as you do whatever you are doing, you have a master called Jesus. Now think about it. Those of us who are working, if you have a boss over you and it's, you go in the morning and he has put work in your in-tray, do you go to him and tell boss, I don't think I'll do this. I've come up with my own schedule. This is what I'll handle. You do that. Can you go to your place of work? What you will make there? I love you. I know. You know what I'm saying? I know. This is what I'll do today. So, this is what the Bible is saying. The head of every man is who? Christ. So, you need to find out what, is, what does Christ want me to do? And the only way you can find out is searching through the pages of this book. Is attending Bible study. Is meeting here as men and cheering up with each other. Praying together. Realizing your potential. Realizing your purpose. Realizing your privilege. Realizing your place of uh, superiority. So Paul says, 
I want you to know. So we know. Sindio. We know that the head of every man is Christ. Now look at the next place. The head of woman is who? So you are the source of her leadership, her authority, her direction. You are the source. So he says, you draw from Christ and your woman draws from you. You see that? That's the pattern. You draw from Christ and the woman draws from you. Now look at uh, the last part of that scripture. And the head of Christ is who? God. So that's the pattern. God the Father, God the Son, and the, the man, the woman, and the family prospers. The family prospers. If Christ be not your head, then where are you getting your authority from? What is your source of leadership in the home? How do you govern your home minus Christ Jesus? It means then you use the authority of Satan. It may look like a joke. There is no vacuum in life. If Jesus is not leading you, Satan is leading you. There is no vacuum. Even the same nature abhors vacuum. Nature cannot allow the vacuum to be there. So either the head of every man is Christ or the head of you is who? Satan. You must choose. You know Satan tells Eve, ah, God is a liar. If you eat of this tree, you will not die. He tells you that you will have pleasure. Pleasure eating of this tree. You will become wonderful. You will have be, be like God and have knowledge of good and evil. So he's telling Eve the best way to honor God is by disobeying him. Have you ever seen that? Telling Eve you can become awesome. And the best way to become awesome before God is by rebelling against him. And he's using the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, telling him, telling Eve this, this is where things are. Come and obey me. He tried that with Jesus Christ. He told him, hey, don't do that. Don't. Don't go away hungry. And I'm here. Why don't you turn this stone into bread? Okay. Why don't you jump from up there and fall down? You'll be wonderful. Why don't you worship me and I give you everything here? But Jesus had his father up full of the Holy Spirit. He only used one weapon which says, it is written. Now, I will like men like you as you sit together like this, as you plan together, you approach every situation, every difficult situation with what? It is written. It's written. Even when you are praying over your children, pray over them with scriptures. I remember there's a day in the town, Dika Ototo Wangu, Papa, 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 Nika Wasome, Proverbs. Wanalia, Daddy, Papa, I'm leaving you for death. They still remember I'm back today. It is written. That's the sword of the spirit. That's the only offensive weapon we have. You know, the rest of the weapons, we learned through the budding ministry, the rest of the weapons are defensive. You put them on. The only weapon you can attack the enemy with is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's called Makaira. Sharper than any two, double-edged sword. It penetrates up to the place of where? The soul and spirit and then the bone and the marrow. You imagine something that can divide the bone and the marrow. There's no surgeon who can do something like that. Even the surgeons don't know where the soul is and the spirit is. They have never seen it. But the word of God it is written. It is written. Now the Bible has two Adams. Do you know that? There's only one Adam. There are two Adams. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 21. Bible says 
For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. So, Adam messed up and uh, everything happened. There was death of relationship, then there was physical death, then there's eternal death because of what Adam did. So by man came death, but Christ has brought hope where Adam brought damage. Okay? Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. We have hope in Christ Jesus. Now go to verse 45. Verse 45 says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Even when God is calling Adam, Where are you? Adam is ashamed. Adam is running away. Adam is hiding. But God is pursuing him, not to go and kill him, but to restore him. You get that? When God is pursuing Adam in the Garden of Eden, it's not to go and punish him, but it's to go and restore him as an act of grace. And God himself slaughters an animal, covers Adam with this, the skin of the animal, and the blood covers the sin of Adam. Because the blood of a creature is the one that consists of the life of that creature. So the life of an innocent animal had to die, had to be lost, that Adam may have now a relationship with God. And now that was a picture of Christ Jesus who will come and die on the cross and pay for our sins, that if we believe in him, his blood will not cover our sins, but will take away our sins. And if our sins have been taken away, these challenges we are going through, we can overcome them through the blood of Jesus Christ. The first Adam brought failure, brought desperation, brought hopelessness, but we have the last Adam who has brought life. He has come to restore us to a place where we lost in the Garden of Eden and not only to restore us, but give us much more. So the man right now does not need to be hiding and ashamed and running away. The man right now needs to be believing on Christ Jesus and doing exploits because now we have the life of Christ in us. But the problem of the man, he's looking at himself. He's looking at his abilities. He's looking at his education. He's looking at his tribe. He's looking at everything from him. And then he feels that he is unable to achieve the purpose of God. But if right now you stop looking at yourself, stop taking a selfie of yourself, not spiritual selfie. And now look unto Christ Jesus, the last Adam. He'll give you life to accomplish each and everything that you're supposed to accomplish. We are tired with children crying, children suffering. There are so many children on the, on the streets and their fathers are rich. Their fathers are rich, but their fathers are absent. God is asking where are you? There are so many of our daughters now being slaughtered in Airbnbs because the fathers are not there to give them guidance, to show them love. Girls are seeking for love from men outside there and they are being slaughtered every day and night because the fathers have gone missing. We are not there to guide our families. There are women who are desperate, distressed, depressed and dying because the husband are missing. The society is missing the leadership of a man. The church is missing the leadership of a man. And God is asking us, where are you? Where are you? The only thing I can challenge you as a man is to arise. To arise. Stop being delegated to an inferior position. God never created a man to be inferior in any circumstances. I've requested Maranga again that if he allows me, once every month we have this fellowship at this time. You can continue with your normal discussions, but let's challenge each other once a month. Let's find spiritual inspiration once a month and find out where are we? Amen? So when God comes asking this question, 
one month from today, each and every one of us will have an answer. Praise God. You are blessed. Dear friend, you may have watched this message and yet you are not born again. It's not an accident, but God's plan. All you need to do now is believe that Christ Jesus died on the cross and settled the penalty for all your sins. When you rely only on this finished work, you become the righteousness of God because all your sins are forgiven. You become a child of God with all the rights of a son. You will never ever perish because you have eternal life, the very life of God. You're welcome to worship with us every Sunday from 10 a.m. We are located at Umoja Inako Estate along Moy Drive, directly opposite the Umoja 2 Chief's Office, Nairobi, Kenya.